I love getting to watch baptisms like Isaiah who come from a place of deep darkness, just like what we talked about, just what we just sang, and comes to a place of freedom. In our first service, uh, I want you to know this because it was it's so exciting. Uh, we had a 93-year-old man uh, make a decision recently. But let me tell you a little backstory for a second. I, I shared this in the first service. Here's a guy who, uh, he was one of our warriors. He fought in the Korean War. Uh, he was given orders uh, that... Uh, were hard to orders for anybody to follow because he had to take some lives, uh, lives, and um, he really struggled with the orders that he was given and the actions that he uh, courageously took. And he went to a pastor and said, "Man, I can't sleep. I can't. Uh, I can't rest. I have so much guilt and shame." And that pastor said to him, "There's nothing God can do for you." So for 73 years, he lived with shame and guilt until a, a Lake Church, who was his neighbor, Lake Churcher, who was his neighbor, knocked on his door and began a conversation with him, invited him to church, and he said, man, these people are actually pretty, pretty, pretty all right. He heard the gospel, and uh, this past fall, he made a decision to follow Jesus at 93 years old. Then, then he led his daughter, who's 76 year old, to the Lord, and I'll baptize her uh, soon too. But just what we sang about, you know, God is faithful. He is faithful. Jesus, thank you. Thanks for the celebration of baptism that we have this morning with Isaiah, with Bill. Lord, we're grateful that. Uh, when you say that your, your, your grace covers, it covers. It just covers. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, David Chester, a leading scholar in aggression research at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Aggression research. I didn't even know there was such a thing, and I was, I was uh, reading some articles, and, and um, he says that aggression or the desire to fight or that critical spirit that we have within us, it, it is usually a result of how it feels so good to get revenge. Now, we know that, that that feeling doesn't last very long, but if you've been wronged or maybe that perception of being wronged, like that, that uh, when we get revenge, that just feels so good. And what that does physically is it gives us that dopamine hit that he talks about is, is that same type of positive sensation that, uh, that, that goes through those same neural pathways or those same neural circuits that if you're a methamphetamine uh, user or uh, uh, addicted to pornography or uh, any other type of addiction, it just feeds that. And it shapes our behavior in that way. He, he goes on and he says, and people seek it out when they're feeling bad. They use it like a tool to help them regulate their mood. So that critical spirit, sometimes what he's saying, or, or anger or the desire to fight, like we, we use that as a tool to help us regulate our mood. And when we do that, it activates these addiction circuits in the brain and reinforces the behavior. In fact, it was interesting that they're planning on launching a trial drug to, <laughs> to address our aggression. Now, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Uh, now, Chester, Dr. Chester was only telling us how the body works. What we know is what he's telling us is, is what, we, uh, what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 3, that there's a sin nature in us that fights against the design that God ultimately had for us. But you may be wondering, you know, is fighting always such a bad thing? No, it's not. In fact, we see in the New Testament where, uh, you know, fighting is actually a good thing. We're told to fight in some ways. 1 Timothy 6, 12, where Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Ephesians 6, 12, where Paul also is talking about, uh, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against the, but we're wrestling against the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenlies. Like there's this war, there's this battle, and we are called to fight that. So I don't think a drug is going to be good for us. In fact, there's something that we just got to redirect 
what we're fighting against or fighting for. Now, there's a lot of good things to fight for, right? You know, we ought to be fighting uh, for the lives of people, which means we're fighting against things like human trafficking, slavery. You know, there's five million children who are in uh, human trafficking and slavery right now, over approximately 40 million people uh, worldwide that are slaves still today. We ought to fight against that. We ought to fight against those who are starving or water depleted. 815 million people a day go hungry, and 9 million die every year because of starvation. We ought to fight for the rights of the unborn. 3,000 children will die today in America, 3,000 tomorrow, 50 million worldwide this year. We ought to fight for widows and orphans, 150 million orphans in the world. In America, 400,000 unwanted children in the U.S. foster care system. By the way, there's approximately 350 churches in America. Do the math. Like, we could actually solve that problem. We ought to fight for the unsaved. 150,000 people die every day and face a holy God who decides their eternal fate. Three billion people have yet to hear the name of Jesus. A lot of things worth fighting for. But I will tell you that perhaps the thing that is most important for us to fight for within the church is unity. Is unity. In fact, I would tell you, and I hope it's obvious to you, I mean, probably the greatest fight that we have right now is unity. I mean, in a season where there's political unrest and social unrest and and church unrest, I mean, the world needs to see Jesus' people as one. Obviously, there's an enemy that exists to deceive and to divide and this idea, if, if we think that unity is going to just happen because we gather and sing kumbaya, and I know that's not where you're at, but I, I want you to understand the enemy it, will go to great lengths to make sure that division continues to happen, which is why this is an ongoing fight, and it has been, if we read the letters of the New Testament, it has been an ongoing fight since the church was born. So if you have your Bibles, I want to turn to John chapter 17. And, 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 you know, why is this important? Why is unity and oneness important? And quite simply, it's this. is because Scripture teaches us that the, our influence as a church, as believers on the world, is directly tied to the unity that we display, to the oneness. The church is to be the apologetic for the world around us, and unity is the litmus test for that. So John chapter 17, great passage. This is Jesus' prayer toward the end of his life here on earth, toward not just his disciples, but his future disciples. And he's praying to the Father. And uh, Beautiful prayer. We're, we're going to read the last portion of that, verses 20 through 26, and we'll just kind of uh, walk through verse by verse after I read the whole thing. It says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make known, make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, here's this prayer. 
toward the end of Jesus' life. And, you know, you've heard uh, it said before, oftentimes the last things said are the most important things, right? I know when uh, my grandmother was in assisted living and she, we knew that she didn't have much time left, my sister and I, we got one of those giant VHS camcorders. You guys can Google it over here and see what I'm talking about. And we just stuck that in front of her and we just said, hey, talk. Like she was born in like the early 1900s and there was just so much incredible wisdom that this woman, and she was a godly woman too. Man, her name was Grace and man, she lived that out. And man, we just wanted to hear everything there was to know. We, want, we wanted to know what she had to say and we had that on videotape and it was just such a treasure for us. Well, here's Jesus. Man, he, I mean, he has not only been, uh, uh, I mean, from the foundation, I mean, he is an uncreated, eternal being. He's now lived on earth with a bunch of guys like you and me for the last 33 years. And this is what he says. This is what he says. In verse 20, he says, I don't ask for these things only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one. He could have said a whole bunch of different things. Man, he could have said, y'all all need to believe this perfectly. Like, y'all have to have perfect theology. He didn't say that. I'm not d disparaging that at all. I mean, there's some doctrines that we, we have to, that, that are uncompromising. But that's not what he says here. I mean, he could have said something like that. He could have said, you know, hey, when you guys do church in the future, this is what it ought to look like. He didn't say that either. What he said was, that his church would be one, that we'd be unified. I mean, incredible. And here, he's saying that knowing what Judas has already done and already had told, looking at Peter and saying, hey, you're going to deny, deny me three times, he knows there's going to be division, and his prayer is, I want my church to be one. Look at verse 20, 21 again. That they may all be one, just as you, the Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Here's the deal. So we're wondering, you know, how, does, how is oneness achieved? How is this type of unity achieved? Because that doesn't mean that we all look alike, or we all listen to the same music, or we all believe everything exactly alike. I mean, that's not oneness. It says oneness is going to be achieved when we live in him. Did you catch that? I mean, he's saying, I am in the Father. The Father is in me. And I'm praying that they would be in us. He's talking about the, the Trinity, talking about his plurality. We're going to come back to that here in a second. Listen, oneness is only achieved when we are in God. I love Oscar Thompson. He was a writer, pastor, preacher. Uh, he wrote this really great book called Concentric Circles of Concern. And in that book, he talks about two different relationships. We have a vertical relationship. We have a horizontal relationship. In that vertical relationship is that relationship between us and God. The horizontal relationship is between you know, us and each other. And here's what he says. If your relationship between you and God, your vertical relationship is out of whack, guaranteed that your horizontal relationships are going to be out of whack. You want to experience oneness? You've got to have that vertical relationship with the one true God. Look at verse 22. And the glory that you have given me, I have given to them so that they may be one as we are one. That's crazy. I mean, just pause for a second. Good news, this passage preaches itself. I just don't want to mess it up, okay? Like if anybody else other than Jesus makes a claim like that, I mean, that's blasphemy. He says, the glory that the Father has given me, I'm giving to my people. I mean, can you imagine the implications of that? Like for some of us that think, man, there's no way that unity and oneness can really be achieved. Like, you know, we're, we're Rolodexing back through like our experience and we're thinking, man, this, this can't happen. If you knew what was going on in my life, there's no way that that's going to happen. If you knew my family, if you knew my workplace, if you knew, you know, this or that. And he says, but I put my glory in you. Like it is achievable 
not because it's going to be your outworking, it's going to be my outworking. And he, he goes on, by the way, verse 22, you know, so the glory that I've given, uh, that you have given me, talking to his father, I've given to them. And then there's this purpose clause here. Some of your Bibles translate it so that, others just that. It's the Greek word henna, which signifies that there is a purpose clause, so that they may be one, even as we are one. Like he's giving us his glory so that we can be one. So that we can be one. Look at verse 23. I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that, another purpose clause, we're gonna come back to that, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So two purpose clauses back to back. Verse 22, verse 23. Verse 22 says, I'm giving you my glory so that you can be one. I want you to be one so that the world may know you, you, you tracking? I mean, that's the progression of thought here in this. There's, um, I mean, ultimately, what he's asking us is to be the message. Like, of course, we share the message, right? But he's saying, you, be the message, be the representation of me, of my glory, of my ways. I mean, you've heard people say you might be the only Bible that anybody ever reads, like as they watch you. There's a, on a Prime, uh, Prime Video right now, there's an interesting documentary called Jonathan and Jesus. It's really interesting. Um, Jonathan Rumi, who is, plays Jesus on The Chosen, I like the dude. Um, you, you've been watching The Chosen? You know what I'm talking about? So... I think it's good stuff. And uh, Jonathan Rumi, it, it chronicles, kind of follows him around as the actor who plays Jesus. Now, no question, if you're playing Jesus on the most watched biblical show in the history of television, there's probably some extra pressure going on. And I mean, it's crazy as they're walking through. I mean, there's, you know, people coming up confessing their sins to him. And he's like, ooh, you know, and they're like kissing his ring. And like, hey, will you pray? And will you tell the Pope this or that? And like, he has none of those powers and he knows that. But here's the reality. Whether you're on the chosen or not, like we're to be a walking representation of the glory of Jesus. We're to be the message. Again, the church is the apologetic for the world around us, and, and unity is its litmus test. And, and note, too, as, he, as you know, Jesus is talking here, I mean, he, he notes that we have been sent to love people. <laughs> you know, nobody's ever been judged into heaven. We, they've only been loved into heaven, right? Look at verse 26. Jesus says, I made known to them your name, and I will, continually, I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Just a side note here. You know, I think it's interesting sometimes how we label people based on uh, particular, uh, you know, literal truths in the Bible. You know, if we make a biblical statement about moral behavior, uh, in the circles that most of us probably run in, we're considered conservative and very biblical. Sadly, though, if we make a biblical statement about avoiding disunity and pursuing oneness, like the Bible says literally, our stance sometimes is considered soft, cowardly, and compromising. And when I read Scripture, what I will tell you is that the fight for unity is just as gritty as the fight for moral truth. Maybe even more so. And what Jesus is saying here is that you need to possess this truth. You need to, you need to uh, walk in that love. It's like Tozer said, just because you believe a truth doesn't guarantee that you possess it. But note too that what Jesus is calling into, this oneness, this is relational. He's not talking about styles or denominations. I mean, in context, they didn't have any of that anyways. 
He's not talking about theology. Although we know, like we're not diminishing the fact that there are certain doctrines that are absolutely, without question, uncompromised. I mean, we're standing on those all day long. All day long. But what he's calling for is relational oneness and honoring, a humble serving, a treating others as better of your, uh, uh, than yourselves type of Philippians 2, oneness. And don't miss that he says that it's achievable because one, we're made in the image of God and secondly, he's given us his glory. So if we disregard this oneness, know that not only are we disparaging the cross, but we are disparaging the personhood of Jesus, the Godhead. So what's our model for this oneness? Well, we see it in, in how Jesus talks about himself and his relationships in this passage. It's the Trinity. There's, uh, back in the 300s, there's three guys named, uh, known as the Cappadocian Fathers. It was Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of Nanzensis. It's a little bit of a tongue twister even today for me. And these guys, when they were describing the Trinity, they talked about the Trinity in terms of this divine dance. And it's a beautiful picture in fact, the, the Greek word for that is perichoresis. Para means around, and choresis means to interact. And again, this picture is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are interacting in a loving, caring relationship. There's that divine dance that's happening, that there's intimate interaction happening. There's this back and forth, no person of the Trinity ever living apart from the other that the persons of the Trinity is always giving themselves over to the other, always pouring themselves out for and in one another. Essentially radical other-centeredness. I mean, it points to an invitation of knowing one another. That's the model. That's the picture of oneness that Jesus is talking about here. That's what he's calling his church to. I mean, have you ever thought about how chaotic it would be if the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, like we're at odds with one another? Like if the Son just stopped, like just completely disregarded what the Father said? Or like the Son and the Father, like, hey, let's gang up on the Holy Spirit today. Like it'd be chaos, right? I mean, it's unthinkable if you have a Trinitarian mindset. But if this is what he's calling us to, I mean, think about it in the same way. Like, if we're walking in disunity with one another as the people of God, it's chaotic, isn't it? It's chaotic. And we got to think about the implications of this. You know, Paul talked about it consistently, as I, I said early on in the message. I mean, the, the early church was always dealing with brush fires of disunity. And that's true. That's going to always be true. Like, rarely is there going to be a time where, like, everybody in a church, why? Because it's made up of sinful, broken people like me. So they're always fighting this fight of unity. And in fact, it was a healthy fighting spirit within Paul and the New, New Testament writers when it comes to addressing disunity. But I, I, I kind of wonder if sometimes we gloss over this a little bit. Like we get to the big sins, what we call the big sins. And, I, you know, I think about like Galatians chapter 5. That's where you find the fruit of the Spirit. And we love verse 22 love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faith, gentleness, self control, right? Like we love that part. Like, man, as fast as we can get to verse 22, man, I'm in. But like 19 through 21, mm, it says this. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God of God. Whew. 
I mean, I, I think it's easy for most of us to say, like maybe, you know, I'm not living in sexual immorality or I'm not living in drunk, drunkenness or I'm not a sorcerer. But did you catch, and you probably didn't count, and you don't need to count, but you can go back and count if you want to, like eight out of the 16, that's half of them, had to do with division and disunity. And we ought to tremble at the warning that Paul gives here. That if we continue in that type of enmity, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, strife, divisions. Man, it might say something about whether the Spirit lives in us or not. So where do we go from here? Well... Let me say just a couple things and we're done. One, division is easy when you love shallowly. Division is easy when you love shallowly. Listen, loving well begins with death to ourself and radical grace. Why? We're going back to the Godhead on this, okay? Going back to the Trinity because that's what's been modeled. That's what's been modeled. I mean, think about it. I mean, you guys know, most of you guys know my story. But my story is not any different than anybody else who's saved in one sense. Like, I came from this wayward, sinful place. I was far off. I mean, this is when, when uh, you know, Paul says in Colossians uh, one twenty one that I was alienated and now I have been brought near. Like, that's my story. That's your story. And he brings us into relationships so that we can experience the fullness of the Godhead, the oneness, the goodness, the fruit of that. I mean, he died so that we can live, and he wants us to live in oneness with one another. In fact, I mean, we know. I mean, we talk about it all the time. I mean, the key to a great marriage, to, to healthy parenting, to, to thoughtful relationships is when we die to ourself and express radical grace. It's that picture that we have in Philippians chapter 2, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So I think here's a challenge for us. I mean, if we're going to really love, then I think we have to recognize that, and, uh, that there's two primary enemies because we have the tendency to, I mean, we'll blame Satan all day long. And by the way, I mean, he, he is, uh, he, he's going to try to leverage things all the time. Man, and he, I mean, he's after it. He is after it, no doubt. But we also were like, well, Satan made me do it. Satan did not make you do it. Like there is a war within two and sometimes it's just easier to either look the other way or take the more, you know, our, uh, you know, self-righteous high ground or to blame somebody else. And listen, I've been, I've been guilty of this. I have, conf- in fact, this week confessed this to some of our staff. And in the same way that Paul talks just about this transparent, you know, or talks transparently about fighting sin within himself, I mean, we got to do the same. Like, we have got to kill our pride and our ego and our self-righteousness because it gets in the way of that oneness. I mean, that's, that's what he's asking of us. And just a practical way to, to begin that. So you may be thinking, well, what does that look like? Practically, and, and part of the conversation with our staff this week, we, we talked about how you have to fill in the suspicion gap with trust. You fill in the suspicion gap with trust. You know, Andy Stanley says that there is always a gap between what is expected and what actually happens, what is promised 
and what's fulfilled. You get that? There's a gap between what is expected and actually happens or what is promised and what's actually fulfilled. And there's a gap there. And here's, here's the deal. You have the choice to fill in the gap. And you can either fill it in with suspicion or you can fill it in with trust. So think about it. You know, maybe your, your wife says, um, hey, we need to pay the bills this, this month. Well, maybe the bills don't get paid. There's a late fee. And your wife comes to you and said, hey, I thought we said that we needed to pay the bills. And you're probably going, is that a we, 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 me, we, you? Right, right? But there was an expectation and what actually happened, and there was a gap there. Now, spouse could say, well, I mean, if you didn't pay the bills, you obviously don't care. That may not be true. Could be that you had good reasons and forgot. Or maybe when we talk about this idea of community, and I know some, I mean, that word community um, is understood in so many different ways. I mean, some people just believe that it is a literal living life together, and community does mean that in a lot of ways, and it's a beautiful, amazing thing when that happens. But community for other people may not have the nth degree of that particular connotation. And so you say, hey, I want you to come experience community here. And what you hear is, man, we're going to live life together. Every moment, like, like we're BFFs, let's exchange, you know, necklaces now. And like we're going after it, right? And if that isn't, if that doesn't happen, like there can often be suspicion like, man, you don't understand what this is or blame or you don't really love me or there's something wrong with me, Right? Or maybe an employee, you know, you ask them to do something, you know, within a certain time frame. Here's what's expected. Here's what's happened. And it doesn't happen within that time frame. Again, you're, you have a choice. You can either fill it in with suspicion or you can fill it, fill it in with trust. And maybe you're thinking, well, man, that employee doesn't respect me. He doesn't love our company. I mean, fill in the gap, right? Or until you get clarification... You could say maybe he had a good reason for that. Maybe something was going on in his family. And all this, all, what we're getting to is that if we want to build a culture of unity and oneness, then you have to fill in the gap with trust. Until further clarification, you have to fill in that gap with trust. And listen, I'm not saying that there aren't reasons not to trust. I'm not saying that there aren't things that, uh, you, know, you know, stink and need to <laughs> come to the surface. What I'm saying is, is that if you want to cultivate a cult culture that builds unity, then you have to fill in, you have to place trust in that gap until you get further clarification. Because here's what I know. is man, negative comments draw louder praise than softer criticism today. You know, fewer and fewer people dare to speak up in favor of their brothers and sisters and what's right because attacking voices are just louder and they're more in number. And we learn this as a kid, right? I mean, it's easier to be critical. I mean, this is what the cool kids do. They make fun of others in order to ex express their superiority of some sort. And, and so to stand up for somebody who's being bullied is kind of a fearful thing because you don't want to be the next target. So, to, so, so it's always safer to offer criticism, you know, speak negatively about a teacher or a parent or peers, and sometimes that is true in the church. What a dangerous place to be. And if, again, if I go back to Galatians 5, 19 through 21, man, what a really dangerous place to be. Uh, T.J. brought up in staff meeting while we were discussing this, a great quote from President Bush who said in the early 2000s, he said, we typically judge ourselves with the highest aspirations and we judge others by their biggest failures. Man, what a dangerous place to be. So what we place in that gap is essential. It's either going to be trust or it's going to be suspicion. And here's what I know is true for you, and I know it's true for me, is you need the benefit of the doubt. You need the benefit of the doubt until there's further clarification. 
you need the benefit of the doubt. Like that, that is partly of what it looks like to walk graciously with one another, to love one another. That I look at you and I say, man, you're an image bearer of Jesus and I know Jesus loves what he sees when he looks at you and I'm gonna choose to love what I see when I look at you. I mean, that's partly the essence of what he's saying in, in verse 23. I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Man, I love this. Man, I'd encourage you just to sit with this prayer this week. Just let it saturate your heart so that you get a picture of how Jesus was praying for you. I know when I look at this, though, I'm also mindful that, I mean, this is Jesus saying, I am not going to rest until my people know me. That I am going to fight for the oneness of my people and of my church so that my glory and my personhood can be expressed rightly. And listen, he's been fighting for us since the foundation of the world. He wants his church to fight for unity. And the fight for unity ought to become normal. You want to experience family from God's design, then it requires a fight for oneness. One of my favorite movies, I mean, one of my favorite, favorite movies is We Were Soldiers. Love that. And uh, it's based off of a book that was written uh, by Hal Moore, who the main character in We Are Soldiers, um, uh, or We Were Soldiers, is Mel Gibson plays Hal Moore, Harold G. Moore. And um, he was lieutenant general, awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for leading uh, the, the Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment in the Battle of Adrong in 1965 in uh, the Vietnam War. And uh, it, it's, it's a war movie. There's a lot of gruesome parts in it. Hear me say that. There's some incredible leadership pieces. And in the movie, there is a speech that was made by Hal Moore that Gibson does as he is speaking to his regiment before he deploys them to battle. And it's before, it's a formal speech before family and friends and others. And here's what he says. Now, here in the States, some men in this unit may experience discrimination because of race or creed, but for you and me now, all that is gone. We're moving into the valley of the shadow of death, where you will watch the back of the man next to you as he will watch yours. Now, they say that we're leaving home, but I don't think so, whether we're going to to what home was always supposed to be. Here's Lieutenant Moore's point, is that for us to experience home, it requires a fight. For us to experience oneness, it's going to require a fight. And you can either fill that in with suspicion, or you can fill that in with gap, uh, with, with trust. Would you fight? I mean, you heard me last week. I mean, it doesn't take, and I'm certainly not a prophet, it doesn't take a prophet to go, man, we are headed towards some crazy moments. But I would, I'd encourage you to look at it differently. I mean, we're headed toward an incredible opportunity with the division that uh, we see in every area of our culture and world right now like we have the opportunity to be a light that is so bright. And again, hear what Jesus is saying. Hear those purpose clauses, why he is calling us to oneness. 
so the people may see him and know him. Pray with me. Jesus, would you, um, would you deal with us? Would you speak to our heart however you need to? For us to be right with you. Would you take away any pride or excuse or anything that is keeping us from genuinely seeing who you are and what you call us to? So, Lord, speak. In your holy and your precious name, amen. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. So would you stand as we sing? Staff will be here. Maybe you want to come and pray. Maybe uh, you want to respond in another way. But would you respond as the Lord would have you? God.